This is the Unchained Binge Podcast. I'm Kaylee Fretz, and we're going to go deep on Netflix's new Tour de France docuseries, Unchained. Today is episode seven, Everything for the Podium. In today's episode, we see a lot of Mark Matteo, so much Mark Matteo, plus plenty of David Gadu, and a real close look at just how old Garen Thomas is. Let's get into it. Crew, welcome back, Abby. Hello. Welcome back, Johnny. Hello. Welcome back, Kit. Hello. By the way, still getting tweets about Kit's uh, tangent, Lord of the Rings tangent. People <laughs> loved it. Uh, and so I don't know if we need like a segment in every episode that, you know. Okay, so. No, uh, too much of David a good Gadu. thing. David Gadu, what's Who's David Gadu? Oh, you could, I, if you'd ask me this. If you Harry ask me to Potter. Prepare this, I might be able to come up with something. Yeah, that's probably the best you can get. <laughs> He's kind of the orphan child of that team. Yeah. <sighs> so this episode, this episode, we 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 get a lot of we get a lot of Mark Matteo, we get a lot of Groupama FTJ, we get also get a fair amount of Ineos and and uh, and Garrett Thomas stuff. Just like yeah, more Garrett Thomas basically, and then in particular, they've kind of set these two characters up. One as I mean, David Gadu, who's sort of the, the next generation, right? He's set up as the as the French rider to take over from Thibaut Pino, who, as we were shown in an earlier episode, is is past his prime, right? They gave him the opportunity on Planche de Belfi. He did not take it. He could not take it. And so, therefore, we we, we get vindication for uh, Mark Matteo picking David Gadu as the team leader. David Gadu had the... the you know, the number on their back ends in a one. That means they're the team leader. And he got that number for this Tour de France. So we get this sort of David Gadu versus, versus Garrett Thomas thing at the end of this as well, because they're both duking it out in theory for uh, third place, for the for the final slot on the podium. There is a fair amount of kind of uh, semi-manufactured drama around the actual timing there. There's like there's lots of really epic music as they come up to the finish line together when in fact they you know they're not within a second of each other so one of them would have to drop the other with by a significant margin to make any actual difference we will ignore those sort of things it's a good little bit of drama between those two the young upstart french rider who i'm assuming that the, the, the french public watching this will all be very much behind david Gadu, and the the wily old veteran in, in garen thomas and that's kind of the well that's the narrative that i guess sort of underpins much of much of this episode. Let's start off with the the really quite awkward Groupama press conference at the start of the episode uh, and the start of the Tour de France. So, I guess before that, small amount of context. Maybe Johnny, you're you're the right person to ask about this. So, a little bit of context about like what this scene is and 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 how they all happen at the beginning of the tour and and what like why this was happening basically. Yeah, before the pandemic, uh, the these press conferences would happen in real life. So the riders and the team manager would all be sat at a, a table with a varying quality of, of tablecloth across it, maybe some sponsored water or soapy water if it's for tell. Um, and then they would answer questions about how they were feeling before the tour or other variations on that one question. Um, but obviously in the pandemic, everything moved to sort of video chat. So now you have a different dynamic where it's, that it's like it's very it's much more awkward i think for the they probably prefer it but it's more awkward because the riders are just like sitting there in their own company like the different team leaders and so you, and it's all a bit more it's less fluid so you have like mark maddio being like should i like introduce this or what should i do and then you have him basically announcing to the press corps that david gaudu will be the leader and thibaut pino won't to which david gaudu surely he he must have known this before like he wasn't learning that then but he just seems thrilled at his sort of teammates falling falling off the perch he just like can't it's like one of those situations where you know you're not allowed to smile but he still can't bring himself to not smile i felt i wonder if there's a little bit of convenient framing convenient editing yeah. in this particular scene i mean first of all there's a <laughs> mountain range of distance between the two of them sitting in there well yeah. in a, grubby hotel chairs it was 
probably pandemic protocols to a degree, maybe. Mm -hmm. You know, you could at least give that excuse. Um, but also, you know, we when we had those exchanges like Gadu looking across at Pino with that massive awkward grin on his face. <laughs> and then the next shot you see is Pino slightly turned away from Gadu. Yeah. Um, as if to say, oh God, this is happening. Um, but, you know, who's to say if, you know, if we'd seen the two of them, if it was a two shot, they might have been having a, a chuckle or Pino might have saluted or or whatever. You know, there's something we, you know, it, it was potentially taken out of context. That said, I think we're aware through being around the sport for the past 18 months that there is a little bit of friction in that leadership debate. And then when you add in the sprinter, Demar, um, there is a bit of... Uh, an awkward dynamic and Gedu is uh, the young upstart still he has had results and by the time he was sitting in that room next to Pino he had won at least one Vuelta stage and he'd got some decent results so he's he got a Dauphiné stage as well yeah mm -hmm. yeah so he's of course yeah the great Dauphiné stage where he slipped under Vinat's uh, elbow mm. um, so yeah I think um, although it was very brilliant well <laughs> It was a really uh, entertaining little scene. I, uh, yeah, I was raising my eyebrows a little bit and just, but tipping my hat to Netflix for grabbing the right shots and putting them in the right place. Should, should we should we add a little bit of context around the news actually that happened that happened today as we record this, uh, which was that Arno Demar, the sprinter on that team on Groupama. Uh, was is going to be left at home for the 2023 Tour de France in favor once again of Gadu. So Gadu has sort of, the, the, I guess the year later context around what we saw in this episode is Gadu has really cemented his place as the, the rider for this team. And he retains that place a year later. Uh, Pino's going right. Pino's going to the tour. Yeah. That he, you know he'll he'll chase another stage win. It's his final Tour de France. We mentioned this in a previous episode that he's retiring at the end of this year. Uh, but sort of that context around that team, I think, is is relevant because the team dynamic is essentially the story here. Well, I'd, I'd love to know it, ha, if the Netflix thing has influenced this decision. If Mark Maddio has watched it and been like, this has been great. You know, everyone loves us. Everyone loves Pino. You know, maybe he's like, yeah, podium of the tour would be great. But also if they if they show loads of nice shots of us all being really friendly and my impassioned speeches basically in full... Uh, then why not? And then we'll get to finally meet Arnaud Demar in Series Three, and in <laughs> twenty twenty four when he's yeah when he's with another French team, and then you'll have his whole thing, and then you'll get like a frosty glance between him and David Gaudu as they're riding along, and it'll be great. We love a good frosty glance. We also got some context earlier in the season um, about Pino's slightly topsy turvy relationship with the Tour de France, um, and uh, you know he in the context of this year he wasn't going to go because he did but he's done the giro and he did well and he had a, had a good time he's feeling good so there's uh i don't know there's there are lots of factors at play and i'm sure that was the same last year he had of course just won that tour de suisse stage i remember kaylee getting very excited about that um a couple of weeks before the tour um that pino's back and he'd had a really good tour of the alps as well so he was he was a legitimate leader um so i so i do kind of understand that this was a source of drama and maybe that extra context might have helped to make it even more dramatic than mm. Netflix managed to make it. I've decided that as they sort of sort of fake story or exaggerate storylines that I'm just going to eat all the trash and I'm just going to buy it up because that's how it's intended, you know, and who knows what, which bits are true and aren't anyway, you know, there's so much more that goes behind closed doors, like later in the, in the episode or no, I think it's that, yeah, it's near the start when David Gaudu is like told, telling the cameraman that he can't come into the, the elevator with him, oh. which is Heart which is great. Up. But it's just like, I'm just going to, whatever Netflix feeds me, I'm going to eat it. And if I feel sick later on, then that's that's on me. <laughs> so I think one of the reasons why I, I'm, I'm coming kind of the same boat as you, Johnny, and I think we maybe discuss this in, at length in the next episode, because episode eight really brings a lot of this to a head. But part of the reason why I'm kind of okay with this is what we're getting is essentially like a slightly altered version of events, right? What we always get is a slightly altered version of events. We like we don't get what actually happens in the bus ever. We get a PRified version generally. And so it's all just lying in different directions. And the actual truth is only known 
by the people that are actually on the bus. So if the PR guy is going to stand outside the bus and give us some bullshit about what just happened, I'm okay with Netflix essentially doing the same thing in the opposite direction <laughs> for for entertainment value because the the PR person, you know, the team itself is is essentially either lying or lying by omission or spinning facts in order to make the team look as good as possible. Netflix is lying or omitting facts or whatever to make the team look as interesting as possible. The The reality is probably somewhere in the middle and we never get it. And we could get it if if the teams would be honest with everybody, but they never are. And so I, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of okay with a, some level of nonsense in the same way that you are because because it the, like i said the reality unless you're going to like sit on the bus and get the full story which we never get because they don't give us access to it is never going to come out so at, at that point just just enjoy it i think that's that's where i am with a lot of this stuff yeah i watched this episode twice um a couple of days apart and the first time i watched it i was a bit like oh give him a break give this kid a break um, especially when it got to the, um, the the team meeting when Maddie singles him out, and I know you know he's the team leader. It's, it's all rests on his shoulders at the end of the day. But um, anyway, but the second time I watched it, and I just sat back and let the story wash over me, and it works. It you know we know that Maddie is one of the characters in the peloton or on the edge of the peloton, and uh, we also I think of all the people that we've met in this series. Um, He's one who's probably closest to the truth. And he's definitely, you know, he didn't need to be prodded by Netflix to make a big bombastic speech um, and to point at Gadu and say, mate, you've got to pull your socks up and, well, <laughs> grow up there. Um, you know, it's uh, so. I never expected to hear that phrase from the BBC, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> well, I don't, I, I hate it. <laughs> but it's that kind of, it's a... Uh, that sort of uh, management style that's being used, um, and he's—you can tell by the way that he's speaking that he's—he's he's performing as well, but it's himself, um, and uh, yeah, it, it's also proof of the system that we saw in episode three of the French passion and romance, and just jolly well go and do it—that um, it actually kind of pays off. It was interesting to see the bit after Alp Duez where Gaudu was saying that he he was it's annoying that he didn't have self confidence. Um I feel like it's pretty rare that a writer is that um honest in an interview after a race. And to see that kind of at the same time that Mattia was watching the interview and him kind of scoffing at the the vulnerability that Gaudu was showing <laughs> on screen and also that that Gaudu knew like exactly what he'd done wrong on that climb um it was really interesting I liked seeing that and I feel like yeah that's also not something we get very often is just riders being honest in post-race interviews it's a lot of like thank you to my teammates thank you to the staff if rarely actually well sometimes but not nearly enough <laughs> but yeah I, I thought I found it just interesting that so the way that they so we, we get that intro kind of press conference thing. The purpose of that is to set up uh, probably a sort of a small amount of tension between Pino and Gadu, but also just set up Gadu as like he now has the weight of France on his shoulders. And then they use a bunch of clips from what looks like kind of like sport talk TV shows to kind of like reinforce that that like. This is important to the point where it's making it onto television shows that are being beamed out to the French public and this is being discussed. And not to always a super positive reaction, right? Like it didn't feel like the the French public was necessarily behind Gudu yet. And Mark Matteo seemed to be like copping a bit of flack for for making this decision, right? And and he fe a lot of the sort of narrative around like later in the episode is sort of Matteo proving that that decision was correct. In fact, he addresses it kind of directly near near the end of the of the episode. I found that whole angle just quite interesting because one, as sort of English speaking media speaking to English speaking fans, you know, Groupama, to be perfectly honest, is not necessarily like 
Johnny, you and I weren't in that press conference <laughs> with, with the with this team last year because it's just not high on our list, right? Like we're going to go to Ineos, we're going to go to Yumbo, we're going to we're going to go to some of these other teams before we go to Groupama. And and our uh, French isn't good enough. And our French isn't anywhere near good enough. Uh, but I don't remember this being like a a bombshell moment across cycling, but they kind of frame it as a bombshell moment across like French fandom. And I think that that does serve, it's it's a clever thing because it, it serves to sort of increase the importance of everything that happens over the rest of the episode. I thought that was really actually like cleverly and well done and not even really over dramatized, just sort of like putting the full weight of these decisions sort of into the show really effectively. Yeah, it really sets up the coming of age story that we get. He's shown that he can win things at the Dauphiné, but then he loses his confidence. And then through a speech and a bit of a, um, a well, he, he he's very self-aware, I think. Uh, you know, he says he's, he questions himself a lot. Um, and so there's, you, you get the impression that he's ready to dig deep. And then, of course, you get the redemption montage um, of him climbing. It was the Horticam stage, wasn't it? The stage uh, nine. 18 whichever when he was just clawing his way back to to Garant Thomas so yeah I, I agree there's that they build a foundation that really accurately or really effectively uh, creates this um, coming of age story for little Harry Potter <laughs> can we talk about um, David Godu being a Twitch streamer <laughs> yes <laughs> well this is touched on in the episode like we see him Twitch streaming, and in particular playing, is that Pro Cycling Manager? Is that the game? I think it's either it's either that or the, the like the Tour de France official version of it. Mm. One of them. Yeah, I, I think it's but the yeah, same so underlying will... game though, right? So yeah, yeah. Like there is a video game where you can be you can manage a professional cycling team and you have to like get them to yeah. the season and and all the rest. We actually in a previous life, I think Matt Denise reviewed it at some point. Uh, anyway. A new version comes out ahead of the Tour de France every year, and and Davigudu Twitch streams it. Which for anybody who doesn't know what Twitch is, it's it's, it's a well, it's basically like an enormous live stream platform. You can like play video games, and people watch you play and interact with audience and whatever else. Not something that a lot of pro cyclists are are doing on a on a regular basis. Well, it's also he in his spare time he's cycling on a video game. And he's also like, I, I wrote about it last year when we found his Twitch channel by virtue of him doing a four hour stream, like the week after the tour, explaining, like going through like his race, which I get, which is great in terms of that sort of access that he's given to his fans and stuff. Um, but he would beforehand, he would be playing the game and winning the Tour de France with his own character, which I think is great. Um, you know, just sort of like trialing it, like cosplaying as himself, but three places higher um but what was what was the other two things that were great was mark madio just basically interspersing the footage of david Gaudu playing video games with if Gaudu wasn't a cyclist he'd be totally anonymous <laughs> just like okay all right um but then it was interesting how then Gaudu agreed with him and said like you know he's like he likes doing that sort of thing because he's shy and i kind of wanted to pick abby's brains about this and in terms of the the pros that she's knows never come in come into contact with like what proportion of them would you say are this kind of introverted shy character because i feel like you do hear it from quite a few riders sometimes but then i'm always like are they telling the truth or is this just a, a clever way to not 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 talk to us because they they're saying they're shy but it would seem like a sport and a practice that lends itself to yeah i would say actually the vast majority of male professional cyclists that I know or have come into contact with are really, really shy. That they, they're kind of the nerds who like got super into the numbers that have to do with cycling and then it just happened to also be an athletic endeavor. And a lot of the men that I know that are professionals or even amateurs, like they're not super keen to talk about it. Like, you'll always be a better friend of one of them if you don't mention what they do <laughs> with most of their time. Um, so I would think, I, I was watching that and I was like, oh yeah, this is spot on. I know a lot of guys <laughs> like that. <laughs> there's a very, there's a couple that are like characters, right? Like, there's a couple that are that are out there. I mean, I think Tom's loves 
a little bit of a uh, spotlight. <laughs> He's a little bit of an entertainer in a way. And, and there's definitely guys like that. But yeah, I think most of the ones that I, that I know or I'm friends with are like pretty shy, pretty nerdy, like love the numbers. I, I feel like that's changed too. Like I mean, we, we always sort of joked, particularly in the earlier part of my career, that you could kind of be too smart to be a bike racer right like back sort of before the numbers ran the sport quite so much before the training was quite so analytical before all these things when it was just like go out and hurt yourself i think that was probably somewhat of an un- unfair characterization i think i think intelligent racers have always done well but there was sort of the joke that like you spend so much time just staring at your handlebars 6 hours a day that you kind of had to like be missing a couple brain cells to to actually do that and i think that has very much shifted in well if you listen to a lot of our other podcasts for example if you listen to geek warning and you listen to ronin on a regular basis like ronin's a very smart guy and part of the reason he has always one he's a very he's also a very uh, talented athlete but part of the reason he kind of got to where he was which if you don't know ronin is like he's got he just he just broke a record for riding across ireland over the weekend for example uh a lot of that was and is like attention to detail and an analytical mind and an ability to to dive into all these tiny tiny little moments and find the way to be slightly better and i think that these days that type of personality does particularly well in professional cycling and i think that's what the david Gadu character kind of showed us or, or presented uh in this episode versus some of the earlier characters that were a bit more brute force like Watt Van Aert feels feels quite brute force through this episode I think also like maybe something the show hasn't highlighted quite well enough is how tactical cycling is how much of a chess match it is there's like many many layers to the actual sport of cycling that is not are you the strongest are you the fittest and I feel like those types of brains do really well you know forming scenarios in their minds and working their working out how they're going to win we used to play this game when i was on a professional team all the time is you'd throw out a scenario and it like in long on long car drives and be like hey how would you win if this is the race scenario um and Mm. that's something that you know i don't i think it takes a very tactical mind to try to work out how to win and all of these guys that are have made it to this top level are most of them are like very, very smart when it comes to that, because you have to win races in order to get to the world tour and get to this level of racing. And they may not win very much in the pro Peloton, but they they got there for a reason. Yeah. Everybody at the Tour de France won almost everything they entered for a very long time because <laughs> one, they're very talented and two, they're very good at what they're doing in, in sort of all facets. Right. That's an interesting thing you just said, Abby, which is the, the, the game that you used to play. Because that's essentially a real-life version of the game that David Godou is playing on Twitch, right? <laughs> like, he is literally playing a game where you run through scenarios and you try to win via tactics. And granted, there's a lot of other stuff going in that, going on in that game that doesn't really happen in, in, in real life. It's a game. But that is basically what he's doing, right? And I, I think that that's a really interesting... I, I almost feel like... and. I'd be interested if you guys agree with me. I feel like David Gadu is sort of the most developed character we've had thus far in this entire series. And I think that's a really interesting decision. I think it helps that we don't hear an awful lot from him uh, generally. And if we do, it's very much race-based. Um, mm. uh, so, you know, how he won that particular day or what he's going to do next. He keeps his cards quite close to his chest. And yes, I think that might be different in France. And for those who are in his fan club or on his Twitch streams, I don't know how that works. I don't know what you call yourself. If you're a Twitch Twitcher? No, that doesn't sound right. Um, I think you're just a streamer. Streamer. That's the... Yep. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think it helps that the 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 blank page. Well, it was a relatively blank page for me. I think um, I understood that he was a decent rider and had had a bit of character to him, but uh, didn't know him as a human being outside of the sport. I want to make a point about the episode title because it's a bugbear for me for sports and documentaries. This one's called Podium. What's it called? All for the Podium? Everything for the Podium. Okay. So a a couple of years ago, 
um, Arsenal Football Club did like a whole Amazon documentary series, which was called All or Nothing. And they followed them for the season and they didn't win anything. So then it was, well, well, it's nothing then. <laughs> so it's kind of like, but so then it's, then it positions it being like, well, you know, what was the, what was, what was the point? And then I think like when you say it's all for the podium, well, or everything for the podium, yes, that is like what they were aspiring for. But then when you see them, the reaction afterwards to David Goldu getting fourth, that was still like an amazing achievement and the, t- the team and him were very happy about it. So I kind of, I felt that that wasn't ne- like, yeah, it'd be great for him to be the guy on the podium and the first podium since 2014. But then he was also the highest fin- French finisher since 2017. Um, so I don't know, that was just a one, maybe probably insignificant bugbear of mine because most of the one most of the episodes haven't sort of done that you know i guess it's the the um face to face with thomas um yeah it, it's also a mm. little bit misleading i think i think um and he, i even got slightly caught out by it when we, um gadu and thomas were well when gadu had been dropped and he was chasing back on and he had, we were being told he had to get past quintana um and then catch up to thomas and there was mention on the um well as we understand the recreated commentary there's a mention of him being 43 seconds off thomas which in that moment i got momentarily caught out um being a journalist in the sport thinking that he was 43 seconds on that mountain 43 seconds back on on thomas so i think that i imagine that might be a confusing point with as far as the general classification is concerned um obviously we know that when he catches up to garrett thomas that's when the 43 seconds is back in play um and um, you know he's got to get he's got to then um, get ahead of Thomas to chip away at that gap the thing is as well like we'll, we'll get into this in later episodes but you know even talking about the general classification like a couple of people who've watched this as complete newbies they get to the end of the series and be like what is the general classification <laughs> because it is like two words that don't really mean anything out of context and especially in that episode seven where they're showing these names moving up and down a leaderboard that then has names on it you've never even heard of in the race and also no timings next to it because you've got all these jerseys and then these leaderboards and if they just put like the timings and like you know at 41 seconds at a minute at two minutes it would at least show what they're competing for it was just like even though like we knew the context of it I was still looking at like what yeah, is they were also what is badly this? timed because when he caught up to Quintana that's when his name moved over Quintana which isn't how it works mm. because he yeah. <laughs> it's not like leapfrog <laughs> yeah we're gonna take a short break when we come back old man garrett thomas All right, so the the other the other bit of this episode, the other side of this episode was a, a rider near the end of his career, Garen Thomas. We talked quite a bit about this in the previous episode. Uh, we may have actually been kind of getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but he, he Garen Thomas features heavily in in this episode as well. He's in his mid late thirties. Um, I should be clear that when I when I joke about him being old, it's because he and I are roughly the same age, and I think I can do that. Uh, I'm given the right to do that by being the same age as Garen Thomas. We're both over the hill. Uh, yeah, his his whole thing is is like hanging on, right? And that that's the way that it's portrayed, and also proving the doubters wrong. Everyone who said you're over the hill, you're done, you will you'll never compete at the front of the Tour de France again. It's like a big middle finger from him up to all of those people, all of the press, like us, uh, all the fans, the people in his in his Instagram commenting, you know, all these people. That seems to be the underlying theme here. It's interesting that for the second time in the series, they've portrayed G as like this old man up against the younger generation because they literally did the exact same thing in the last episode with Pidcock they had like old man Garrett Thomas hobbling around on his cane (laughs) and like Pidcock spry like jumping around doing parkour like in circles around him and then they literally just like they were like oh did you did you get our point that Garrett Thomas is old well we'll do it again in this episode how did you feel about the the text and then the uh oh 
my my wife's just texted me that I was in high school when and Pagatra and Jonas Vingo weren't even born. How did you feel about I that? Laughed. If he was acting that, he was doing it very well. <laughs> it was good acting if it was fake. I think that actually happened. Yeah. You think? Yeah, I think it happened. For sure, yeah. I think it happened. Like, n- none of these guys are good actors, so you can tell when it's acting, right? Like like the the, the some of the sort of semi-faked uh, l- like director meetings, particularly early on, like the, like the EF one in was it the first or second episode that feels just like completely like uh, like john the Botters is a terrible actor sorry jv none of them are good enough actors to like fully get some of that across and in fact i think the best acting we see is some of the sit downs when they have like kind of the mood lighting you know some of those sit downs are definitely not taking place when they appear to be taking place and i think mm-hmm. what is happening and and i would actually i would love to chat with the netflix folks and, and confirm this maybe while we're there this summer what i think is happening is essentially they're they're going to Jonas Vingo being like okay put yourself in in this in your sh- in this in the shoes of stage 17 in the morning how were you feeling what were you thinking and then they they cut it in later so like there is a that's the best acting we see we see basically but it's because they're asking them to essentially like repeat what they were thinking a week ago and say it in a way that they would say it anyway my point being i i think this garen thomas bit that that it feels like something he would do slash say i would like to point out that somehow garen thomas has been able to put a screenshot of that moment on his instagram page and Roglic commented with a laughing face emoji, crying laughing face emoji. <laughs> I mean, they're pals, right? Their kids are, are friendly. I, I don't know. Oh, yeah, they are now. Yeah. I think what really first stood out to me about those talking heads um, is, and we know by, through following the sport that cyclists um, tend to balloon slightly in the off season. Balloon is maybe a strong word, but they, you know, we, we wow. often see... You know they let their, they let their hair down a little bit. Um, they're not training so hard. They need a bit of a refresh, as we all do. Um, and the tour is the um, the event of the season when most of them are trying to peak. And Ralph Van Aert's the most obvious, who is different in his during Tour de France interviews as opposed to his pickups, which I assume were well, they were definitely a few months later. Um, whether they were actually in the off season, um, don't know that. But yeah, I think they're they're from my. Um, I don't know, my observation at a distance, you can kind of tell that, like you say, some of the um, questions they've been asked to try and let them off their acting a little bit in a more general way to explain what would happen on a stage like this. Mm -hmm. So it kind of lets Vinger go off when he has to pretend a little bit. But 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 there are other places where I think they were happening beforehand. And like you say, their acting isn't up to enough um, so maybe I'm, I reckon it was probably the first rest day. They sat everyone down, um, or, or they sat a few people down. I think there were definitely some interviews during the tour. That's my f- assumption, anyway. I was most impressed by these guys speaking in their second languages, but like then like using a different tense to describe it. I was like, that is. I mean, for for like some of them, I guess they it's like for a Danish speaker or a Belgian speaker, maybe it's easier. But I was still still pretty impressed by that um that's coming from an englishman though that's uh we, we, we're not very well uh well taught oh we're, we're tenses yeah, <laughs> no maybe. i just mean that we, we ain't, that we ain't most, good. <laughs> um, most of these cyclists speak more than two languages fluently and yeah. you and i johnny unfortunately True. i don't know what i don't speak know whether well. the american system is better well. but the uk language learning system is all about passing tests isn't it it's not about giving interviews that's why we get the yeah that's why we get the dubbed the dubbed <laughs> horribleness yeah. um yeah th- i think the thing with the just jumping back quickly about be done in a minute um about the garant thomas texting i think i've just been burned by watching the fake reality show love island where they literally set it up so they get a text and then they scream i've got a text and then something consequential happens so maybe it's just like mm-hmm. a bit like a pavlovian response to garant thomas <laughs> getting a text and maybe he'll end up on love island one one day you never, you you never s- know still watch love island no, but it's once you've once you've watched like one episode, you can never you can never like undo that, you know. <laughs> we got more Orla <laughs> in this episode, which I liked. I, wish I think there she's was she's a lot more. Orla. I wish they would have replaced more Steve Chanel with with Orla. I think she for 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 us fans, she goes a bit deeper. I think slightly deeper. She also seems less like she's delivering a lecture. Yeah, or at least trying to teach teach kind of newbies. 
she's more passionate about it from an insider's perspective. And she kind of comes to the defense of Garen Thomas in this one, which I think is interesting. Yeah, she like it's maybe that's why Steve Chanel was used as like the Will Buxton guy who kind of just says what it is because she does put like a kind of a slant on some things and like gives gives opinions without really giving opinions. Like it's more maybe maybe and maybe it's more like contextual, I guess, which then is weird as well because you de- you never get con like the only context you ever get sometimes is from Orla who pops up like maybe twice an episode. Yeah. But um maybe that's the reason. Yeah, she delivers the sense around the story at the time. Um and Chanel is more basic uh, information. But I feel mm. like Orla is amazing for the sport. She has so much passion and the way here, that here. she delivers lines is is just so compelling so i wish that they just used more of orla in the series as a whole because there was entire episodes where we didn't get to hear from her at all and i feel like she's just such a great voice for the for the sport so i really wish they'd used her more i i hope for season two that they incorporate her more a little bit once we don't need like the obvious lines about how like when you cross the line first you've won the race um <laughs> they can throw more orla it is kind of a thankless job that steve chanel got but and and mostly because we know all the things that he's saying but it, i do think it's important and i think it's interesting that they split those two things out i think it's interesting that they gave him those lines and they they in general let orla be kind of slightly deeper that's right? exactly what i was gonna say he's he's seemed more scripted than she was and that yeah i guess i don't know maybe that endears uh well it makes her role slightly more um important or um or impactful um not saying that steve chanel doesn't do a decent job of explaining but he does also contribute to some of the bombast which as we've discussed isn't necessarily always great um but yeah i i want to know if um david miller's glasses were scripted or if he if he just brought them along in his in his bag because they are also I swear they get further down his nose every every episode and like by the end they're just gonna fall off which also reminds me I think it might have been it was one of the Ineos episodes where they're in the team car and at some point the driver's glasses just fall down like after someone says something did you guys spot that I, that I thought it was just a fun I missed that one but oh. but David Miller's sunglasses David Miller's glasses are definitely a a key character across the entire uh, entire show, I would say. I, I agree. More, more Orla would have been good for a lot of different reasons. Um, I do think that she's most effective and sort of moves the story around most effectively in this episode so far. Uh, like I said, the the sort of defense of, of Garrett Thomas is is interesting. Um, you know, as a as a yeah, I, I've heard her make those defenses in person before. Like she she. I, I carpooled with her off Alpe d'Huez like six, seven years ago. Uh, it would have been six years ago. So it would have been post five years ago, post post Garen Thomas victory. Um, and we we were just talking about Garen Thomas and I was a little bit more sort of, I guess, skeptical of Sky at the time. And we had a, we had a great debate on the way down from Alpe d'Huez. And uh, it was kind of nice to hear what I know is her actual opinion of a lot of this stuff kind of reflected in, in the show. So that, again, a bit of a, behind the scenes context there that like i think she was allowed to just state what she believed of those moments and i think that that's part of the reason why she comes across so well in this episode in particular it was also a nice balance opposite mark Madio's um uh reaction to thomas at times um i mean <laughs> one of the most interesting parts from him was when g was dropped and uh and he smacks the i don't know it's part of the car. <laughs> I'm not a driver. This is no, no, well, I don't know. He just he he makes some noise and then he's and then he takes a pause and then he goes yes as if just to really emphasize it in in English. And then we get the you, there's no room for sentimentality, which is interesting from Madio and the French team that's based on romance. But um, <laughs> yeah, that's all there is room for at Group Bomber exactly, sentimentality. Yeah. And we're talking about Pino for half the time. He decides the five seconds where there is no room for sentimentality. Then it's turned back up to well, 10 I, that's what I want, was beginning to wonder is that was it actually about Thomas that he was saying all that stuff because it was a talking head again and I wonder if he was if it was actually plucked from a Pino conversation mm. um, and uh, whether it was a leadership debate and this is that's purely speculation but it, you know it was if you put Pino in that frame instead of Thomas you wouldn't bat an eyelid 
that that was what he was thinking. And it's part of the reason why Gedu was the leader instead of Pino. But I don't mm. know. That's just me being skeptical of uh, the the editing and the relevance. I think the other two really interesting things from a Garrett Thomas perspective on this episode were one was we remember we remember the last episode that we watched and we talked about how Jonas needed a bike change and he was screaming, I need a bike. Um, I need a new bike into the radio. And, <laughs> and it was so chaotic. And I, I think it's really interesting with that happening in the last episode and also how the team handled the new bike, which his DS was also like very flustered and really panicking at that moment. And then you had that next to Garrett Thomas in this episode, like, yes, the, the old man in the Peloton, the seasoned professional. And he had, um, his DS on the radio saying like, Hey, you should change your bike. You have a rear flat. And it was like, just like super calm, super chill, arguably in like a more important moment in the race because they were on a climb and he actually like would have lost more time versus on a flat road with your whole team around you. Like you're, unless anything's really wrong, you're going to get back into the bunch relatively quickly. But it was really funny to see the two different perspectives because, because Garrett Thomas like didn't even, I mean, he probably knew that he had a rear flat, but he was just kind of, he didn't like yell or anything. He, his DS was like, you have a rear flat. Can we change your bike? <laughs> And, then, and he just kept riding, which is great, which yeah. is exactly what you That's should what be doing, too, be. as opposed to as opposed to the Jonas Vinka go like, get off my bike, get on a bike that's four sizes too big, switch to another bike that's way too small, finally get on the right bike. Like if you just calmly wait for the car to show up, keep riding until it gets there, you know, better to move forward than to, to, than to not move at all in this tires. I think. I don't know if he was running tubeless at that point. Anyway, we're now we're getting the technical side of things, but he could he could ride it. Basically, Whoa. is my point. <laughs> uh, and, and and they never really like you see the flat tire, and you get this sort of like dramatic moment where David Gadu is chasing, 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 and then they kind of just, I guess they kind of just paper over the fact that like the only reason why Gadu caught back up is because Thomas had a flat. <laughs> like, actually, it wasn't really like that dude had pulled himself up by his bootstraps and, and closed that gap he just literally like caught him because he lost 25 seconds changing a bike just kind of like didn't just they just moved on from it which i thought was was quite strange they also there was this moment when the stage had finished and garant was on the tt bike and he was being interviewed and they asked him if he believed he could have done it. And he said that he believed, but many other people didn't. And they asked, do you think the team believed in you? And he said, I don't think so. Um, there was a lot of talk about the younger generation and this and that. And what it, it is what it is. It's nice to be riding well and be the best of the rest. And I think that's super interesting in the context of this current age of cycling with Tade Pogacar and uh, Jonas Vinegard, Vinigo Vinegard, where we have like these two young guys that are just kind of like a head and shoulders above the rest of the peloton. And people are literally just racing for third. And we actually saw that. And it's something that we've long suspected, but we really saw it in this episode between these two guys. Well, I think that's why then you see such celebrations in the Groupama FDG bus uh with you know they're putting on the most french song and they're all like having a sing song and a little dance because they've finished basically second of the of like the human riders in the, in the human <laughs> the human race um and like they're, they're throwing the piece of paper at each other and like Thibaut pino like pantsing like one of his teammates uh i didn't realize he was a man capable of of pranks i thought he was just sort of sullen and um, so that was a nice little insight um but yeah that was just like it that was sort of after all the tents like of uh, like the racing and then you just see like a french school trip where everyone like the the crazy teacher is like putting the music the like the music on and it was just it was just like so french it was kind of a feel good it was a feel good finish to this episode because everybody ends up pretty happy right they they set yeah. it up as like this big battle between these two riders and that there's going to be a winner and a loser and at the end, it turns out both of them feel like they won. Yeah, right? and then Gidu right. says, I would really like to be the next person to win the Tour de France. Only time will tell. And I was like, oh, bless your yeah. heart. <laughs> well, that, sum that sums it up because it's like you have Ivingago and like these other guys who are in like the the more unfeeling teams, like the Yumbo mm. Vismas, the Ineos, where it's like kind of all business. And then you have 
David Godu being like, well, I guess it would be nice mm. if I could win. And then they're also all like singing songs and, you know, can you imagine like any Oscar and Dears after, like after that stage, like getting on the bus and like singing, I don't know, an Oasis song or a Beatles <laughs> song. Like that would never happen. And that has never happened. And Mark Medio had a very kind of, um, I don't know, realistic moment, pragmatic moment when he said, maybe I'll never get there, but I'm going to keep trying, uh, you know, talking about getting a race, mm. getting a team to win the Tour de France. And that's, that's kind of like, okay, yeah. If it, it might, if it's not happy, it's content, you know, with the way it turned out. Yeah. We also had the most uh, high profile journalist moment of the entire series. I was so, so jealous. I know, right? So, you know, Johnny and I waking up every morning, putting our faces on, Did making so many sure interviews. that we're prepared to end up in the Netflix show. Yeah. Nothing. Nothing. I, I, I'm in. The, I'm in. Uh, one shot from a drone from like 400 feet up. Mm. <laughs> that, that's the. That's the extent of it. We we're making sure like our foundation was blended in the morning, so there wasn't any streaky bits. <laughs> All and the then, stuff. so it was. It was Ed Pickering, who's editor of Ruler, and then Dan Benson, who at the time was editor of Vela News. And I, I texted him when it came up. I was like, oh, you know, Star and Roll episode seven. He's like, oh, no spoilers, but. I hope I'm not like he's like I hope I got my clothes on for now I was like what were you getting up to on the tour where that could be <laughs> I don't know but yeah they got they got like they got so many shots and like a full you know they got a whole interview their yeah. interview made it into the episode I guess at least it was some representation for the for the written press you know yeah yeah we do do stuff when we're out there it's not all we basically do exactly what they were doing dinner. every single day multiple times so yeah, I, maybe I, maybe a bit less good than those two, but yeah. Dan Benson and Ed Pickering are very good at what they do. Uh, I like I like seeing that. I like seeing that. Yeah, I'm actually really glad that we weren't <laughs> that we didn't end up end up anywhere in it because you know you know yeah. that it would just be like some stupid question that we asked at some point and we would just be embarrassed by it the entire time. So it's for the best. Like when we asked Tom Pidcock how many garlic cloves he'd eaten because that's what he ate to like get rid of his COVID symptoms or something. So that would have been a dumb one. Um, I think Dan Benson they had a sneaky good tactic of wearing a France football shirt. Ah. Because then it's like, you know. <laughs> I don't think he'd ever admit that, but I think it was genius. Now we're getting into the weeds. We're getting into the weeds. All right. Uh, we're going yeah. to wrap up today's episode. That was episode seven. We've got one more. The next episode, Road to Paris, uh, which I believe is focused on... The Jakobsen story, whether he can get to Paris, and then, of course, the sort of finale around the yellow jersey. So we'll be back with that episode as quickly as we can make it. This has been the Unchained Binge Podcast, Episode 7. As I've said a million times already, you can get all these as quickly as we make them on the Unchained Binge Pod channel. Just search for that wherever you get your podcasts. If you're already a regular listener to our other podcast, make sure that you, well, you can still get it there on the regular Escape Collective channel. Also, if you want to get our tour daily episodes, we, we record a podcast, kind of a, a punchy, what happened in the day, color, what we're having for dinner, all sorts of good stuff, podcast every single day from the Tour de France. Uh, you can get those over at the Escape Collective channel. So make sure that you're subscribed to that you want to make sure you get those episodes all right thanks for listening everybody we'll be back with another episode soon bye-bye